not an intellectual answer to your questions, but an experiential, emotional answer to the questions. He felt at peace. He felt content. He felt free. And that was what all those questions were leading to. So after a while, you know, you find that a really good meditation just answers every question you could ever think. And our, until that time comes, we have to ask questions. And of course, being open to people asking questions is a wonderful thing for us to do. And honestly, I will tell you that when you ask a question, I also try my best to answer it to the best of my abilities, because I respect people's courage to ask questions. I remember one of the sayings, I learned a long time ago, if you're too afraid to ask a question, then you know, remember this. If you ask a question, you may feel an idiot for five minutes after you ask a stupid question. But if you don't ask the question, you'll feel an idiot for the rest of your life. So it's worth it. Please ask the questions. And the last thing about asking questions and because sometimes when I give a talk, it's hard to find a question. So I always tell people that many, 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 uh, not many years ago, obviously many years ago, but I remember reading this story by the Buddha that when somebody came to ask him questions on a rebirth, reincarnation, the, 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 he asked, well, why is it? that some people are born wealthy, while other people are very poor. What did they do in their last life to be poor in this life? And the man asked, what should I do to be wealthy in my next life? And so the Buddha said, you know, the, the cause, the karmic cause of wealth. is such a good answer, the man asked a second question. And he said, what do I have to do to be attractive in my next life, because some people are born ugly. It doesn't matter how much money they spend in spas or face reconstructions, they're still ugly. What is the cause of ugliness? And you may have heard me say this before, you probably have. But one time I was saying this uh, question uh, in Singapore, and this one Singapore lady really complained afterwards. Because what happened, when I mentioned the word ugly, just my gaze happened to fall on her. And then she complained, why did you look at me when you were saying ugly? I said, well, unfair. But anyway, I gave the answer. It's actually even more dangerous as a monk to say the word beautiful when you're looking at somebody. People get the wrong message. That's why I like giving the story over Zoom. Zoom is no problem at all, because I'm looking at all of you. Anyway, when it came to the answer to this, uh, gave a good answer to the question, but then it came to the last question. Why are some people intelligent while other people are stupid? Sometimes you may have had children and your children, you give them extra tuition. You try your best to encourage them to pass their O levels or their A levels or the university degrees or whatever. And still they fail. They just haven't got that intellectual ability. And in fact, I have noticed that half the members of Anukampa Bikuni Project and those who follow Anukampa Bikuni Project, half the members are below average intelligence. They have to be. That's what average means. Half of must be below average, so the other half are above average. There's nothing ashamed about that. But what do you have to do to be above average intelligence? And this is when the Buddha said that the how to be above average intelligence in your next life is to ask questions in this life. So this is your opportunity 
all of you who are below average intelligence or above <laughs> average intelligence to actually increase your prospects for the next lifetime. So it doesn't able... help them this time. You know, it helps them this time as well. But look at you. And I said, half of the people who associate with Anukamba Bikuna project are below average intelligence. The ones who come online are the ones who are above average intelligence. <laughs> but I think you understand what I mean. So those of you who have a question to ask, please ask those questions and we'll attempt to answer them we. as we will attempt to answer them as meaningfully as possible. So, and if we don't answer the question properly, please ask it again. So we're going to give you some minutes uh, to write your questions to Derek. Is that correct, Derek? So Derek's up there. And if you scroll on your little box on the chat, you should only get Derek. I'm not sure if that works, but um, and he will pass them on to us and myself and Ajahn will answer. So it's potluck. Take your chance and we'll see if the answer that you get yeah. is helpful at all. Yeah. If not, the other one can. The tough add. questions I'll give to Ayachanda and I'll take the easy ones. But who says you get to choose? Well, I'm this is Bikuni I'm, Monastery. I'm a senior to Well, you. but I'm a senior Bikuni than you. Okay. Um, okay, here we go. So, shall I read them out and you can decide whether you want to answer it or not? Yeah, I'll do the first one, you do the second one. Okay. Okay, here we go. The first one. Dear Ajahn and Venerable, I seem to have a mental block regarding how to meditate. Could you please explain the basics, basics step by steps? Okay, that takes a bit of a while. I'll probably cover those uh, type of questions in the first talk, which we give tomorrow in the morning. But basically, meditation is about stillness. Stillness is resulting from letting go. When you don't do things, the mind becomes still. Be careful, because at first the mind becomes tired. And when it comes tired, people think that they're doing something wrong. Here's a simile, which I'm sure I'll repeat. It's a simile of the donkey and the carrot. How do you make a donkey move? You can beat it with a stick, but the donkey is too stubborn to move. So instead of hitting the donkey, which is a very bad thing to do, you tie the stick to the, to the donkey's neck. So the front of the stick is two foot in front of the donkey's head. On the end of the stick, you tie a string. On the end of the string, you tie a carrot. And that donkey can see a carrot two foot in front of its mouth and so moves towards it. That's how you get the donkey to move. But Buddhist donkeys, the ones who are above average intelligence, and half of the donkey population are above average intelligence, and those who confer to being Buddhists, those donkeys know how to catch the carrot really easily. First of all, they run after the carrots, and after running after the carrot as fast as they can, then the Buddhist donkey stops. And that's the trick to stop. That's what we mean by how to meditate. Stop. And once the donkey stops, the carrot swings further away because of the momentum. It's been Donkey's been running after that carrot. So imagine that the carrot moves further and further away from the donkey. And the donkey doesn't do anything, it just waits. Because then the carrot at the top of its uh, arc stops and starts moving towards the donkey. And when it's at its usual position, two foot in front of the donkey's mouth, it's coming at top speed towards the donkey. And as it comes at top speed towards the donkey, as it swings close to the donkey's mouth, the donkey remembers the importance of kindness. The donkey says to that carrot, carrot, the door of my mouth is open to you. Come in. 
And that's how the donkey catches the carrot. So that's actually what meditation is. It's learning how to stop and letting the mind be peaceful. And that's when the carrots start falling in. So that's never ever think that you can't meditate. Always add the three letters Y-E-T afterwards. You haven't learned how to meditate yet. But once you get the trick, it's just so easy. And it's so peaceful. You can catch carrots all the time. You know why I had a tea time? Carrot juice. I never had to catch the carrots. Somebody had the carrots. They put them in the blender, whatever it was, and had carrot juice. So that's how you catch carrots. And that's how you meditate. Shall I? Yeah, your turn. Okay, so the next question is, any advice on how to look back on a long-term relationship that ended, that was full of happiness for 10 years, but then suddenly stopped with animosity? I have a lot of sadness when I look back on the happy times. So to me here, there are a few things, but um, I think the first thing I would say is that if at this moment you have sadness, your sadness is what you need to really look at at, the, at this time. So rather than trying to look back in a way that you're not feeling, have a look at how you actually are feeling right now and see if you can make peace with that. Because sadness is a natural part of things, when, especially when things change and especially things that are very precious or valuable to us. So don't try and push the sadness away, but see if you can open your heart to that first of all. Uh, okay, more questions are coming. Um, and also, secondly, it's very easy to look back on a relationship and think that it's full of happiness, but actually, in reality, no relationship can possibly be full of happiness for 10 years, continuously, non-stop. There would definitely have been times that were difficult or times that were frustrating, irritating, etc. And as well, there would be happy times. And suddenly we think, you know, when something ends, we kind of glorify it in our mind and think it was always wonderful. And then suddenly it stopped and there's all this animosity. But the reality is that there'll be mixed feelings now as well. So even that animosity will change. Relationships don't just suddenly end. Even if you don't see the person, your relationship with the relationship or with the way you remember the relationship will change as well. So when you're in a, a mood of sadness, then of course you might look back with nostalgia or sometimes you might even be happy that it's ended. Whereas when you're in a mind state of metta or happiness, your relationship with those memories and with that person will be completely different. So it's important not to fully trust our perception or get into kind of thoughts about it and you know notice when those thoughts are kind of spinning a story about something that is probably not quite the truth and just deal with whatever emotions are coming up by opening your heart to them and allowing them to be and then you'll find they'll change on their own in time so this is what i would say to you at the moment anything to add oh no okay i hope that helps Sadness has a lot to teach us. Okay, so the next one. Yes. In, in, in my meditation, when the hindrance, hindrance is quietened down, there is peace and detachment, sometimes even bliss. But every so often when restlessness begins to quieten, I all of a sudden plunk into a state of lucid dreaming. I'm aware that I'm asleep and fully conscious of my dreaming. A bit later, I just as abruptly jerk back into the awake state. This is not a pleasant experience and completely out of control. What kind of skillful means can I use here? First of all, check that you are sleeping enough. I mean, on the bed, because sometimes people just force their body way too much and they have this tiredness. And so when they get sleepy, it's like the brain takes this opportunity to take a rest. And you get to a state of peace, it's lucid dreaming, but lucid dreaming is not really accurate. It's there's still some hindrances are there and you've been reality in lucid dreaming. So it's not a useful state and especially uh, you 
jerk back into the awake state, which is unpleasant. Another thing which you could do, if you do have that lucid dreaming a lot, or you know you go into some weird states, they're, and they're peaceful, they're nice, and how to get out of them. Uh, this is where, if you have that awareness, to ask yourself. This is the same that people have out of the body experiences. In order to get back into your body, don't just try and get back straight away. Say, I will come back into my body, or I will uh, come awake at the end of the count of 10. 10, 9, 8, 7, no, down to 1. Because what that's doing is giving your mind and body gentle instructions, giving themselves a time to come out of some of these weird states. Instead of jerking out of them, which is unpleasant, you just ease out of them. That's how hypnotists take people out of um, the hypnotic state. And because it's slow and gives the mind a chance, and it's uh, conditioning your mind to come out, it's much more pleasant and has far less um, difficulties afterwards. So there's two parts to that. First of all, make sure you're having enough sleep. And I say that because, you know, too many people, they try too hard and they are sleepy. And eventually, just when you let go more, this, is, you know, this natural sleep takes over. So see if you can rest a bit more, make sure your body feels really good, and then to see what can happen. Okay, so uh, which one? Okay, I'll go for the comic cause of wealth and beauty. So someone's asking, what is the comic cause for wealth <laughs> and beauty and vice versa? So you're concerned about poorness and ugliness, perhaps. <laughs> it's my story, my simile, remember? Which simile? Simile about oh, asking questions, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one of the comic causes for wealth is being generous, yes? And one of the karmic causes for beauty is supposed to be being kind, being always very generous also, and developing wholesome qualities. So you've probably noticed in your life that the people who are perhaps physically perfect in you know whatever standards we uphold as, as beautiful, and yet if they have angry mind states, you know, anger or meanness or irritability, they become very ugly. Their features change, whereas when we have a good heart, a pure heart, and we act with loving kindness and gentleness towards all beings, there's a radiance about a person. There's a kind of aura that's very appealing, very attractive. And that's one of the reasons that, you know, when you develop a lot of loving kindness as a teacher, you tend to get many students. It's not a physical sense of beauty, but it's something attractive, something that wants you to, you know, helps you, makes you want to stay with that person in that person's presence. And I think it's important, which is the main reason I wanted to answer this question, to remember that um, karma is always important to see it in terms of cause and effect, rather than to see the effect in somebody and assume the cause. Yeah. So if somebody does to you look ugly or if somebody is poor, that doesn't necessarily mean they were mean. It doesn't necessarily mean they were unkind, because karma has many causes. There are many causes for poverty there are many causes for ugliness or for misfortune yeah and karma is only one of those causes there are other things like illnesses or accidents or what are some of the other causes um weather yeah so it's important not to use karma in a way that judges others you know because that can really lead to a kind of callousness of heart if we see people who are struggling and we think, oh, well, they must have really bad karma, they're not like me. If you work hard, you get lots of money. And obviously, they're not working hard enough, you know, each to their own. That's not the teaching of karma. The teaching of karma is always to be aware of what we're doing in the present moment and look after our intention and make sure that's very wholesome and beautiful. And you can leave the results to nature, leave the results to Dhamma, trusting that they will always move in a wholesome direction. So I think the most important aspect of karma is looking at intention. And the Buddha said that intention is karma. Yeah? It's what we're doing right now with what we have. So don't worry too much about like trying to put particular causes in place, hoping for a certain effect. 
but look into the heart and ask yourself, what really is my intention here? You know, is it as pure as it can be? Maybe there are mixed motives and that's usually the case, but how can I purify those motives a little bit more so that they're on the side of kindness, gentleness, and non-possession, non-control? Not trying to be an owner of your actions, but just acting in you know, kindness and generosity and with purity of heart and then allowing the results to be what they will, trusting that they will produce good fruit in time. So I hope that helps. The next question from Argentina. Amazing. I am not a skilled meditator yet. <laughs> but I added a Y-E-T. I have some gastric issues. And as soon as I set my breath in my stomach, I usually get a lot of emotions and memories. If I dig in, my stomach seems to relax and pain just decreases. But I'm not sure that it's what I should be doing. Help, please. Look, if you do have uh, physical problems in one's meditation, then find out you know, what relieves that um, uh, ill feeling. And just by digging in, I'm not quite sure what you mean by digging in, but if your stomach seems to relax and pain decreases, not just when you're meditating, but afterwards as well, then great. Then carry on and see what happens next. But later on, you don't need to put your awareness uh, in your stomach. And I, I very rarely watch my breath in my stomach, especially in the evening time, because that makes me hungry. Remember, I don't eat in the evenings. So when your awareness goes to that tummy area, you think, oh, I need something to eat. I'm hungry. But anyway, one of the other types of meditation, which I would recommend to you, and it would make you a skilled meditator, is just getting to the heart of the meditation by just realizing now is the only time you have. And whatever is in front of your mind, whatever that is, made that the most important object of meditation in the world. Whatever you're experiencing right now, that is the most important. And what to do with it is to care for it. Caring, like being careful. You know, you're aware and caring, you're being soft and kind to it. And then you find that when you have any bad feeling in the body, and you practice that, now's the only time, and that feeling is the most important thing in the whole world. Right now, care for it. So often, that feeling in the body gets less painful, gets less of a problem. You relax around it with that caring. And often, especially in you know, my own experience, it disappears. But don't think that you have to be watching your breath all the time. When people, you know, they do their meditation and they don't, they're not mindful of what's right in front of you, but you're trying to get somewhere else and trying to be with the breath or trying to do this and trying to do that. You're not really aware of where you are. You just you know, have this fantasy of where you want to be you know, with the breath. And that causes a stress. So if you are got a, a painful stomach, that becomes the most important meditation object to watch. It's right there, right now. And if you're kind to it, well, just see what happens. It usually just disappears, or at least gets much, much less. You realize that's the heart of the meditation. Now the most important time, the only time. Whatever's in front of you is the most important. And the only thing to do is to care for it. And the problem usually goes away pretty quickly. Again, I hope that helps. Okay, so I think I'm going to do the next two as kind of together because they're about that sticky question of thoughts. And most people have uh, problems with thinking. Thinking is something very natural to the mind, so it's important to address that. 
So, dear Ajahn and Venerable Chanda, when thoughts are coming during the meditation, how should I treat them? And the other person says, what can I do when my mind starts wandering? So just as Ajahn was saying, everything that arises in meditation, whether you think it should arise or it shouldn't arise, is just arising due to causes. It's nature, it's natural. And everything is asking us to learn to relate to it with wisdom. So really, the best way to treat thoughts is just the, the same way that you treat anything else that arises in the mind or anybody else in your life. The best way to treat them is with kindness and with acceptance, with patience, yeah? and not to try to get, them, get rid of them or push them away. So one of the difficulties is we always think thoughts are a problem and then we think, oh no, I can't meditate. What do I do about this? And we don't want them to be there. And that just fuels the thinking process. So for myself, usually I try to check, first of all, what my attitude is towards those thoughts. And then when I know that I've got an attitude of kindness and acceptance and I'm not getting irritated with them or wanting them to go away, then I just allow them to be there, but I don't give them too much importance. You know, it's like the thoughts are coming in and, you know, sometimes get very intense, but then they just drift out again. And there's moments of silence there too. So I always like to practice what Ajahn Brahm encourages, which is to also notice the space between the thoughts. Notice when there is not thinking. You know, because sometimes we always have this negativity bias. We like to focus on what we think is a problem. We like to focus on what is there. But instead, you can look at when thoughts are not there or look at that gap between the thoughts. Yeah? And you'll probably find that you actually do have peace in the mind quite often. And when the thoughts are there, they become less and less of a problem. So you can just allow them to be there for now. I mean, it's only the first evening of a retreat. So you've been busy in your lives and I'm sure that you've been thinking a lot and trying to problem solve, maybe, you know, working in a stressful job or being with your families and, of course, having to think a lot. So it's natural that there's going to be a kind of a reverberation in the mind. So just be patient and allow them to settle on their own and really don't worry about it at all. It's all about the attitude that you have to whatever arises in the moment. And we can talk more about that later in the retreat. I'm sure it'll come up. The Buddha gave many different methods, but the one that I think is probably quite helpful at the moment is just not to give them too much importance and just to try and relax with whatever arises. Do you want to add anything? No, no. You get this one. Okay. <laughs> what, why, when is anger okay? Anger is only okay when it's right here in front of you right now. So if you are experiencing anger, it's just uh, don't demean it and think it shouldn't be here, because it is here. So we learn to understand it. But of course, you know, in the future, anger is never okay. It's never a, a nice response. A lot of times, and what about as a response to disrespect? If you respond to disrespect with anger, then people are even more disrespectful to you. Many times, and especially being a monk, you know, dressed in the robes here in Australia, or in, not here now, I'm in London now, <laughs> but very often, you know, people will disrespect you because they didn't know who you were or why you were wearing these long, well, look to them like dresses. I do recall over in Perth many years ago, I was just helping fill our combi van up with building material and other stuff to take it to monastery. And this young, maybe 12, 13 year old girl came up to me and she put her hands on her side. In, you can't see it now, but they call it arms akimbo. You know, lots of disrespect. She was looking me up and down and said, that's disgusting, that's sick. You're dressed like a girl. And she was disrespecting me a lot. There's no way I could get angry. I thought it was such a funny thing, I just laughed my head off. And so when somebody disrespects you, if you laugh, then you are the victor not the victim anymore. Anger is a lot of time why people want you to, or they want you to do. I kind of refuse to do that. So instead of getting angry, 
And I noticed when I did get angry in the past, sometimes that will distort your perception. You, instead of anger, to give this kindness and fun, and then anger would never actually hurt. I don't know that, you know, sometimes when I give a talk, sometimes it's a good talk, sometimes it's not a good talk. And sometimes I wonder if I say something and people get angry at me. And that's one of the reasons, if you didn't know, that when you go to a Buddhist temple, a traditional Buddhist temple, they always tell you to take your shoes off. <laughs> and that's so you can't throw them at the speaker if they annoy you. <laughs> That's a joke. I'm good a few years smarty, thank you for that. <laughs> and even bullying, if you get angry at the bully, a lot of times the bully is more bigger than you, stronger, more powerful than you. So instead of getting angry, and if you sort of uh, say words from that anger, a lot of times people just see your anger, they don't see the right response. So instead of getting angry when someone bullies you, if it's a place where you cannot escape like at work, then just this, these days you can report that bullying. Make sure that you've got good grounds. And often I tell people who are at work, if someone is bullying you, that please, you're telling the boss or telling the HR manager or whatever, not just for yourself, but to make sure that that person doesn't have that same behavior to other people. A lot of times people who are bullying don't realize what they're doing and just to know how bad that is and how hurtful that can be. So anger doesn't really work. A lot of times that encourages the bully to you know, be more violent to you. There are other ways of dealing with difficult situations. But anger isn't one of them. Can I also add there that it's important not to stigmatize the anger that you feel? But I think it's a bit of a myth to think that it's a really useful emotion that we can act on because there are other really beautiful motivating emotions. And it's important to process that anger, to feel it, to understand it, to allow it to be there. But the whole point of observing anything in meditation is to allow it to actually subside and disappear. So I always feel that things like compassion and real care and loving kindness are far more powerful methods to overcome any kind of anger. The Buddha only said that anger is overcome by love. He never said it's overcome by hate. So I'm gonna go for this one. Why is one of the eight precepts not to eat afternoon. <clears throat> so one of the reasons for that initially came from the Vinaya, as I understand it, when the monks, and I'm not sure about the nuns, maybe we were a bit more circumspect, started going on arms round in the evening. And they were going through villages with their arms bar wearing these very strange robes with their very strange heads. And people got quite scared and spooked out because they thought they were ghosts. So that was when the Buddha said, you know, please don't make, you know, problem with yourselves. Don't go scaring the villagers, you know, and and uh, and also if you're meditating a lot, you don't really need to eat a big meal in the evening. So the point of it was really for the sake of um, simplicity, for the sake of concern and care for the lay supporters that would be feeding us. And also so that, you know, the main meal can be finished in the middle of the day, which is when our digestion is its strongest anyway. And then we can meditate for the rest of the day. So it's a very wonderful lifestyle when we can have the morning breakfast. And I'm not sure in India if they even had the two bre the breakfast and the lunch. Still today in some Thai monasteries, they just have one meal a day at about eight o'clock in the morning. But most of the time these days in the West, we have the breakfast and then the lunch. But it's really wonderful when we've already, you know, finished our lunch and we get to go back to the forest or back to the kuti and meditate, just as it says in the Buddhist text, you know, one goes rukkamulugatova, one goes to the root of a tree or to an empty place to meditate. And you find that with that meditation, the whole body starts to calm, you know, the breathing gets much deeper, much softer, and, you know, you're not burning so many calories, as you can see with probably both of us. <laughs> and so you don't really need to have anything in the evening. And the Buddha said, come monks, you know, have just one meal a day because it will be good for your health. 
So that's really important too, that it can be good for your health when you have a lifestyle that's suitable to that, you know, when it's in balance with the amount that you expend and also, you know, if you're having a lot of meditation. So it's to encourage that simplicity and, you know, so we don't go working really hard in the afternoons. But if you do have health issues, as I said before, or if you even have to work really hard, then there are other allowances that the Buddha gave. So you can have a little bit of sustenance. And of course, if you're sick, you can make an allowance for that. So it's still a tradition in many uh, Buddhist countries that lay people will also take the eight precepts on particular days of the month, on the Apositor days, and sometimes once a week. And they make it a practice just to simplify their lives and to remind themselves that it's time to go inward. Because food can be very exciting for the senses, right? And it's a lot of time to prepare a meal. Sometimes you're preparing for at least an hour and then you eat the whole thing in 10 minutes. <laughs> so it really simplifies the life. And I think that's really the principle that the Buddha's using in so many of his teachings to just simplify and to be compassionate to oneself and to others, and especially as monastics to those who support it so well. So that's the main reason for that particular precept, as I understand it. Okay. okay. In meditation, what we did, my mind was all over the place. And I asked my mind, mind, what do you want? And my mind said, you need to ask for forgiveness. I'm confused because I often heard to forget others or myself, but I barely heard what to, to ask for forgiveness. That to ask for forgiveness. What is the difference? They're pulling me to forgive. They yeah. heard to forgive others, but not yeah. to ask for forgiveness. That's all you can do is to uh, give forgiveness for others, and. You have to wait until they want to ask you, you know, what, ask my, what do you want? And my mind said, you need to ask for forgiveness. That's really weird what it said. And what do you mean by that? Because this is your language, your, your mind that has asked you something. It's probably to ask forgiveness from your own mind. Maybe you were uh, um, trying to force the mind. You weren't being friendly to the mind, which is maybe why the mind just didn't stay still. But experiment with that first of all. Try to say, mind, whatever you do, the door of my heart's always open to you. That's a wonderful way of giving forgiveness. It's like accepting the mind as it is. And this is actually the heart of what forgiveness is. I'm sorry for trying to control you to make you what I think you should be. Instead, I will be at peace with you as you are. And doing things like that might strengthen your attitude you know, to the mind to be at peace with it, rather than having these ideas of where you want to be and how you want to be and what you want your mind to be. And I don't think it'd be any other person that's causing that trouble. But I don't know if you have another person in your life or somebody you knew from the past who you cause problems to. Or if they think that you cause problems to them. So no matter what, what you can do, you can always ask forgiveness of all sentient beings you've known. And all beings which I have uh, seen and patted on, if I've caused any problems or difficulties for them, I sincerely ask their forgiveness. I do that even with your eyes closed and do that with as much sincerity as you can uh, create. And then who knows, that might actually work and make you feel that any faults which you've done in the past, any of these things which we call remorse for what we've done in the past. Remember the restlessness is always linked in the hindrances with remorse. And that is like feeling that something you've done in the past was not correct. It could be to a mother or to a father or to a child, or just to somebody, a, a partner you had a relationship with. When you ask forgiveness for those things, it takes a lot of the idea that you're not good enough, 
the idea that you know you, you, know, you, you have to do something before you can qualify for peaceful meditation. Everyone can get deep meditation, everyone can qualify. You don't really need to ask forgiveness, but if that's what your mind said, then give forgiveness. If you don't know to whom, to all sentient beings, to everybody, and give forgiveness to yourself as well. And that peace which comes from that sense of forgiveness is actually so inspiring. So anyway, see if that works. Excellent. <laughs> The questions are quite small, so sometimes my eyes are screwing <laughs> to try to read them. So the next question is, I found the Tibetan practice of giving and taking helpful for the hindrances sometimes when I get stuck or carried away by a very strong hindrance and nothing else seems to help. Is this practice okay or should I give myself more to meta practice? So I'm not quite sure what you mean by the giving and taking practice in the Tibetan tradition. Um, I've heard of something called Tonglen, where you breathe in um, the suffering of others and then give out love. I don't know if that's what you're talking about here, but um, here you're saying that that really helps when you're getting stuck or carried away by a strong hindrance and nothing else seems to help. So if that helps sometimes, that's wonderful. I would definitely trust in that. Basically, whatever undermines the hindrances and leads to wholesome states of mind is usually quite a skillful means. But you'll also find when you've been meditating a long time that sometimes something seems to work and you think, that's it, you know, I've got it now. I can always deal with this hindrance. And of course, next time the hindrance arises, you try the same thing again and it doesn't work. One reason because it's maybe not quite the same mind state, but the other reason is because you're using it with an agenda. <laughs> so sometimes when we try things for the first time, they work simply because we do them with sincerity without really knowing what's going to happen. So we're really in the moment with something, we're kind of listening, you know, metaphorically listening to the effect it's going to have. But when we do it in order to pacify a hindrance or in order to get rid of something, then often there can be a bit of aversion mixed in with that. So we have to be careful and, and keep a kind of big toolkit. So I always like to have lots and lots of tools in my kit that I can choose and pick from. And then I just try whatever comes to mind. So again, that method of asking your mind, you know, mind, what do you want to try at this moment? You know, and just using your intuition and, and experimenting a bit can be really, really helpful. With the meta practice, I always find that a really valuable and important central part of any practice. I would never not recommend to do more meta. I think we can never have too much meta. And most people don't have enough meta, especially for themselves and especially for their poor old mind, especially for the hindrances, right? Because the hindrances are things we see as our enemies. And the whole point of meta is that we try to befriend everything in our mind, things that we like, things that we don't like, things that we, you know, maybe have stigmatized before, like anger or shame, anxiety, things we don't want to feel. But these are all phenomena, natural phenomena that arise from a cause. And they're all opportunities to make peace and to understand. Yeah. It's only when we can really come in contact with things, with mental states, with emotions, with difficult situations or people that we can have a chance to understand a little bit more about them, a little bit more about us. So whatever helps you to stay present and to stay present in a way that's open, that's curious, you know, that's uh, receptive and engaged, I think is very helpful. You have to actually understand the hindrance before it starts to disappear. So try the metta because metta is very um, protective as well. You know, with a mind of metta, you can somehow be more resilient to whatever arises. And um, sometimes even if the hindrance is there, it doesn't have so much impact. Yeah. So I was, yeah, very tempted to tell the simile about the salt crystal. There's not a lot of time, but it's quite a powerful one. And it's the one where the Buddha says it's in the Anguttas, I think. I don't know, is it in the threes? Or anyway, it's somewhere in the Anguttas, and it's the simile of the salt crystal. So the Buddha says that if you put um, a big salt crystal, we've got these salt crystal lamps in here, I'll show you. They're really beautiful, big salt crystals. <laughs> and if you put something like that, or maybe a bit smaller in a glass of water, 
then that glass of water is really salty and completely impossible to drink. But if you put a crystal even bigger than that in a big lake, then you can easily drink that water and you won't even notice the salt. So developing a mind of metta, I always think of it as like developing the mind that's wide and expansive and still and cool like a big lake. And then if a hindrance arises in that kind of mind, it doesn't even impact you in the same way. You know, sometimes it can arise and just disappear in an instant because there's nothing feeding it. Right? It's when we don't want it that we feed it. We feed it with our anger and frustration. And that's when it lasts. So definitely I would recommend to do lots of meta practice, not only when the hindrance arises, but even before it arises. And you'll probably find that less difficulty emerges in the first place when your mind is full of metta and love. Next question. At times it is very hard to get the stillness in mind. Mind goes planning the future, work, etc. But it seems an, an empty quiet time. Any advice? A lot of times the stillness, when it's valued, it gets prioritized. Stillness is far more enjoyable than planning the future and thinking. And after a while, you also find that wisdom arises in stillness. So you plan the future, and are you planning the future wisely? In stillness, you get far greater insights. And as for work, etc., please remember that, when, especially when you're on a meditation retreat, this is not the time to plan work. There's one lady I recall, she had a very, very difficult job over in Perth, uh, Western Australia. And she was a very kind, compassionate social worker. But her job was actually to give the final decision on when a child was so much in danger with their mother, they had to be taken away from their mother for protection. It was a very traumatic and difficult job to do. And I remember when she came on a retreat, she came very late because she had to tie up all the loose ends. But she was a good meditator. And she never thought of all of those decisions she had to make as soon as the retreat was over. So she valued the stillness so much. And what she found after three or four days of meditating, when her stillness was strong, that all these amazing solutions came up about things she couldn't really think about, about but very intuitive and original about some of the cases which she had to deal with. And she told me that during this meditation, so many solutions came up. She went back to her room, wrote down those solutions. And she said, I won't think about them anymore until the retreat finishes, but they're amazing solutions. This is what happens through the stillness. You get far greater insights and far greater, deeper solutions than you could ever, ever think about. That's one of the reasons why I always say that stillness is a cause for wisdom. As the Buddha said it, stillness, samadhi, is a cause of seeing things as they truly are. Thinking always distorts the truth. So first of all, stillness is beautiful. And more wisdom comes from stillness than from thoughts. Okay. I've got another question there, but it's similar. When you say stillness, do you ultimately mean thoughts stopping? Yes. The thoughts, a pause between thoughts. It's the same if you're listening to. Uh, the news on a TV or something, you turn off the sound. See what happens. And that's just the first stage of still. Yeah. Do you want to say something? Because oh. we've got five more minutes. I know, because we've got another question. I'll say more about stillness okay. on later okay. in the talks. Okay. 
So the last question for today. I understand that when we begin the meditation, we bring the body to a calmer, more relaxed state by bringing attention to the different parts, feel them and let them be relaxed. I can follow that as the body is tangible in a way. However, once the body is relaxed, to do the same thing with the mind, meaning to feel and relax, seems so difficult as the mind is very elusive and seems to go wild once it gets attention. <laughs> That's very interesting. And I think quite natural as well, because, you know, you've only just started this retreat and quite right. I mean, when the mind has been running around in the world and it's all over the place and it's such an intangible thing and also very fast, right? It moves and flits around really quickly. The body is a really wonderful anchor to actually establish mindfulness in the beginning. And I actually spent the first, hmm, let me think, 96 at least 14 years of my practice life, really developing strong mindfulness of the body. And for me, that was very, very helpful and really helped the mindfulness get quite sharp. And it was through kind of coming to that state of relaxation and calm in the body that I started to experience the mind because when the body in the, is really relaxed, then you start to feel relaxed in the mind. So the two kind of work together and I think the important thing in any meditation is to really um, follow your own intuition. You know, anything that's offered here is just um, one approach. It's just an offering, a suggestion. So if you find that, you know, going through the different parts and becoming relaxed is helping you, I would say continue with that. And after a, a while, the mind will actually feel that it's ready to settle down. You won't feel like moving around the body all the time. And it'll start to become still and enjoy its own peace. Yeah. And at that time, if you wish, you can start to notice the peace. But really, it happens quite naturally. It's quite a fluid and spontaneous thing. So these are all just little suggestions and little pointers to things that might work for you. They might work for someone else or they might work for you at a different time, not, not today. So I would say just carry on doing whatever's helping you. Don't worry about it. If it's going in the direction of calm and relaxation, then that's already very, very good. So give your body some attention because we really do live in our minds, right? And most of the time our minds are just realms of total fantasy and fabrication. At least the body and the sensations you feel there are happening now and you can't really negotiate with that. You know, you can't really put too much fantasy in that or imagination. The sensation is something very real. So just keep working in whatever way um, seems helpful for you. And you'll probably find that the meditation starts to evolve in its own unique way. And it's very different for everybody. So there really is no wrong or right. So don't worry about that at all. Anything to add? Oh, no, that's fine. Excellent. So I think we've come to the end of our first evening together. And I don't know about you, but certainly we're all quite tired and ready for bed. So please, if you wish, see if you can have an early night and we'll see you in the morning. Yes. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs> Sleep well. And pet is meta before you fall asleep. It's the best time. You've got nothing better to do. So go to bed with a few thoughts of loving kindness towards yourself and towards all beings. And that way you might get even deeper, more peaceful sleep. So let's see if you can sleep in tomorrow. I give you a challenge. It says in the um, schedule that there's a personal practice period, offline meditation. But see how long you can sleep. Because <laughs> eventually you'll get bored, right? Or you'll want your breakfast. And then uh, when you come to the talk, you'll be really fresh. So good night, everybody. And we'll try to do the same. See you tomorrow. Thank you, co-hosts.